Hey everyone, it's time for the weekly compilation video. We've been discussing genitourinary syndrome of menopause or GSM this week. Um, and so it's time to put everything together. I've been really trying to think whether I should have some sort of like introduction music or some sort of, you know, fun intro thing. And so maybe I'll put that together um, and um, kind of go from there. And if you have been wondering what the languages we've kind of introduced the videos with this week, you had Welsh on Monday, you had Vietnamese on Tuesday, and you had Croatian on um, on Wednesday. That's the next day of the week. So anyway, um, so anyway, let's talk about GSM. So remember, when we GSM is kind of an umbrella term that's a culmination or an amalgamation, if you will, of lots of different conditions that used to be described individually. The main ones being vaginal dryness and vulvovaginal atrophy. Um, now, you know, that was all vaginal symptoms. We saw that low estrogenic states, and we'll talk about that in a second, also caused a, um, an increase in urinary tract infections or in vaginal infections. And so they kind of put it all together and said, well, you can't just say that, you know, this is all atrophy or this is all vaginal dryness. There's urinary components to this too. And so they wanted to make something that was more of a um, gestalt type term. The other thing is that people don't like thinking that their parts are atrophic, right? You know, that's kind of the big thing. Uh, my dad was an OBGYN uh, before he retired, and he used to re, you know, tell patients that, you know, you, you have to be careful about having a granny fanny, um, which, you know, that's kind of a silly term, but um, it worked. You know, especially in, in nursing mothers, and we talked about this yesterday, you know, where you have really low levels of estrogen, secondary to prolactin, that would cause that tissue to regress. So anyway, the, the basically GSM all together, you know, you've got vaginal dryness, you know, atrophic changes to the vaginal architecture. You're gonna have painful intercourse because of those first two, and then a increase in the likelihood of developing urinary tract infections or vaginal infections. Um, this is something that is a progressive disorder, and that means that once it starts, especially in menopausal patients, it typically gets worse over time. It's not something that gets better on its own, unlike a lot of other menopausal symptoms, especially vasomotor symptoms like the hot flashes, night sweats, things like that, which tend to be kind of self limiting, GSM will just kind of continue to get worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, and, and this is especially true in patients who have POI, you know, primary ovarian insufficiency. If they go through menopause in their 30s um, and they are not put on correct therapy, I mean, think about it. That's potentially, you know, if they live to a ripe old age of, of 80, let's say, or 85, or maybe even more, you know, I mean, 50 years of, you know, kind of those changes can wreak havoc. And when you think about long-term health consequences outside of the kind of psychology of knowing that things feel different and things look different, um, urinary tract infections are a very, 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 very common cause of, you know, emergency department visits, urgent care visits, um, doctor visits. You can be hospitalized for, you know, that. The old term urosepsis is something that comes into this as well. So, you know, really this is something not only that's helping or th that if we identify and we treat, it's not only helping kind of, you know, psychologic function, sexual, fu sexual function, but also just overall health in general. So this is really a very important topic. So, you know, in order to um, diagnose GSM, really, it's just kind of a clinical presentation. You know, now you can get history. Obviously, all history is very, very important. But when you're looking at that vulvovaginal tissue, what you'll typically see is regression or kind of, you know, um, shortening or retracting of the external genitalia, of the labial structures. You may see that the labia minora, kind of the smaller lips on the inside, start to kind of fuse or completely regress. The clitoris can start to shrink in size and the clitoral hood can kind of comb over that and sometimes can even become very adhered or adhesed to the glands or the head of the clitoris. Um, as the um, condition kind of progresses, you'll see narrowing of the entrance of the vagina, or what's called the introitus, and then the vestibular tissue, that tissue that I talk about that's so important because it has both estrogen and androgen receptors in it, will start to become very, very pale. Um, the urethra is located at the top of the vestibule there, and what you can often see with that too is the development of what's called a urethral caruncle, which is where the tissue right on the inside of the urethra kind of rolls out a little bit. It's kind of bright red in appearance. I've had numerous um, consultations for, you know, urethral 
polyp or urethral issue when you look down there it's like nope that's just a caruncle you low in estrogen but this is actually a very common cause of hematuria or blood in the urine especially in postmenopausal patients um, and then if you were to put a speculum inside the vagina what you would see is that the rugae or the folds inside the vagina are actually starting to become you know significantly less in uh, their size their appearance the vaginal canal itself becomes much more smooth, more pale. And then, um, you know, in extreme cases of GSM, um, you can actually see that, you know, even any type of trauma will ca cause little punctate or little point, you know, areas of, of bleeding or um, bruising or things. And then the cervix will also kind of regress back. So, um, and this is all due to basically a change in the amount of what are called superficial cells inside the vagina. Uh, remember, superficial cells are two cells in, in the vaginal sidewall. Um, there's superficial cells, which are these, you know, buoyant, uh, bouncing see glycogen rich cells that provide stretch and allow for trauma and and um, you know uh, keep the pH very acidic um, and then there's the underlying parabasilar cells which are kind of like the architecture or the scaffolding of the vaginal canal um, and those parabasilar cells are not stretchable they are like this is your rigid shape this is what you get and in a highly estrogenized vagina, the amount of superficial cells is quite a bit more to the amount of parabasilar cells. And as those estrogen levels decrease um, and you get into more of a menopausal type appearance, that ratio kind of approaches one to one. Um, and we look at this for you what's, through what's called a vaginal maturation index or VMI. And so that's something you could use if you were doing kind of research and looking at kind of those changes, you could say, aha, we are seeing a, a change in the, the, the VMI there. The other thing is that obviously with low estrogenic states, the normal lactobacilli or kind of good bacteria in the vagina don't have the same type of environment to exist on. And so because they're not there in, in high quantities, they're not doing their job, they're not reproducing, they're not eating and pooping and creating lactic acid, which typically keeps the vaginal um, pH or chemical or like acidity level low or acidic, um, since they're not there, that pH tends to go up closer to a neutral level. You know, whereas before you'd want to see it kind of around four, maybe 4.5. Now you're going to start to see a pH of like, you know, five, 5.5, um, you know, and, and that allows the overgrowth of bad bacteria there. Something like Gardnerella, which we typically see in BV, um, yeast likes to grow in, in that kind of, you know, pH level. And then obviously that's kind of changing that protective barrier around the urethra, which is allowing, you know, pathogenic or bad bacteria to climb up the urethra into the bladder and, you know, deal with those urinary tract infections like we talked about. Now, if you want to get even further into this, there's a thing called a vulvoscopic tissue, or genital tissue appearance scale or VGTA, and that's typically uh, used in cancer patients. And it's more of a um, kind of you know, I don't want to say you use it more in research, but it, it doesn't have, it's not going to necessarily change, you know, the way that you, you know, treat these patients. But, you know, if I have a postmenopausal patient that's coming in for, you know, GSM specifically, a lot of times I'll put in my note that VGTA. And we use what's called a vulvus or vulvoscopy to determine that. And vulvoscopy is taking a big microscope and kind of looking at that, you know, tissue. And it gives us a number. And the higher the number you have, the more kind of menopausal that, you know, tissue is. Is. And then if you put a patient on treatment, then you can kind of measure that over time and say, aha, this number is coming down as we kind of move on. So, um, you know, you, do, you don't need laboratory testing to determine GSM, you know, testing your blood levels of estradiol or testosterone, that's not going to change anything. You know, this is very much a clinical diagnosis. Um, you know, and, and in a menopausal patient who is, you know, having symptoms, you know, you've heard me say this before, if you check estradiol, yep, it's going to be menopausal. Like, I'll tell you that right now, no magic there. You know, really the only sex hormone that we routinely recommend testing in terms of sex hormone supplementation or hormone replacement therapy is testosterone. And that's because we do want to monitor that. It can get super therapeutic. In a normal reproductive cycle, estradiol levels, for instance, can be anywhere from 30 to 330. So to say, oh, well, look at this, your estradiol's 92, or oh, it's 45, or oh, you know, it's 28, you know, like doesn't really help things. And if you put a patient on estradiol therapy, especially systemic estradiol therapy, and you say, oh, yeah, look, your estradiol is now 120, like, okay. 
you know, great. Like, so what? How are your symptoms? Well, they're better. Good. That's all really we need to know, but that's a whole nother topic. So anyway, now treatment for GSM. Um, you basically divide things into hormonal treatments and non-hormonal treatments. Currently, non-hormonal treatments, um, you know, are kind of divided even further into more kind of like band-aid type treatments, such as, you know, vaginal lubricants, moisturizers, things along those lines. Uh, lubricants you use with sexual activity, moisturizers you use irrespective of sexual activity. And you really want to make sure that the, you know, lubes or moisturizers you're using have a good osmolality, meaning they're keeping water actually in the tissue. They're not sucking it out, um, and which could cause even more dryness or irritation. Now, over the past few years, we've seen the onset of a lot more energy-based treatment systems for GSM, things like the Mona Lisa Touch or the Thermiva. Um, you know, all of those are kind of different ones. Data for those, you know, there is definitely some good data about the treatment of GSM with that. And for patients who, you know, either cannot have hormone therapy, which, you know, we'll talk about that in a second, or who don't desire that for whatever reason, um, you know, that's definitely an, an option. Um, still though, and this is just my opinion, the treatment is a hormone, or the problem is hormonal. So if you treat it with hormones, you're actually treating the problem. The energy-based systems basically go in and cause some tissue remodeling, but they have to be repeated over and over and over um, to kind of get that good value. And obviously insurance right now is not reimbursing that at all. So that's a nice little hefty chunk of change there. But some patients swear by it. Um, and you know, empiric data is definitely data. Um, so that's something to consider. Now, in terms of hormonal therapy, <clears throat> old standard, gold standard has been vaginal estrogen. Now, remember, vaginal hormones, especially vaginal estrogens, really don't have a systemic spread of said hormone. You're not going to see a large, you know, bump in serum hormone levels with these vaginal preparations because, you know, with a couple of exceptions, because they are there just to provide target tissue, um, you know, medication. Um, you know, Primarin was probably the first one that's, you know, a conjugated equine estrogen. It's the, you know, been around for a long time since the seventies. Um, and you have a Primarin vaginal cream that you typically would insert, you know, a gram of that twice a week or so. There's everything though, from creams to vaginal tablets, to vaginal suppositories, to a vaginal ring. Um, you know, they all kind of have similar efficacy. It just kind of depends on kind of dosing how you want to do it and kind of some specific nitpicky things. Now there's one oral medication that is indicated for GSM. That's a medication called ospimifene or osfina. It's a SERM, which is a selective estrogen reuptake modulator. It basically um, goes in and um, antagonizes estrogen receptors in like the uterus. And then it actually agonizes or kind of ramps up estrogen receptors in the um, vulvovaginal tissue. So you can get some of that benefit, that treatment of GSM with an oral pill. Um, you know, you've heard me talk about Interosa before. Um, I'm probably gonna do a video on Interosa here in the next couple of weeks. That's kind of, because I've had a lot of questions. That's uh, vaginal DHEA or Prasterone. Um, it's FDA approved for the treatment of dyspareunia, painful intercourse in GSM, but it releases not only estrogens, but also androgens like testosterone too. Once again, just kind of in that target tissue. Um, so it, it's probably my favorite GSM medication. Um, and I'll, like I said, when I talk about it in a little bit, um, you know, I'll, I'll really dive into why that is. But really, you can't go wrong with any of them. And it may be something, you know, you have to try, um, you know, certain ones kind of see, you know, how you like it, how you don't. Um, I'm not a super big fan of the creams just because patients complain a lot about their messiness. And so that's always something you have to consider too. Um, but virtually no contraindications to vaginal estrogens. You know, undiagnosed vaginal bleeding is probably the main contraindication. Um, but, you know, uh, outside of that, you know, you, there's really no contraindications. You could, they're safe to use in patients who've had breast cancer, if they've had a stroke, if they smoke, if whatever, you're not getting that systemic spread. So get on your vaginal estrogens people or your vaginal DHEA um, and, you know, and, you know, start reaping the benefit of, of that. Um, 
you know, and you can use these things together too. That's the other thing, you know, you can use if you're using, let's say, for instance, uh, a vaginal cream that's twice a week, you know, on average, like I said, well, if you do that Monday and Thursday, you could use a moisturizer on Tuesdays and Fridays, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Or you can still use a lubricant prior to sexual activity. So these are not just like, you know, one or the other type things. Now, sometimes patients will ask about systemic estrogen therapy as well as vaginal estrogen therapy. And you definitely can do that. You know, if you find that your systemic therapy is not providing enough GSM relief, then definitely that's something to consider doing a vaginal therapy too. There's actually a medication called a FEM ring, which is an intravaginal ring that lasts for three months that not only delivers, you know, estradiol to the vagina, but also has systemic spread too. So that's a fantastic option for those patients. So, um, you know, other things, you know, vaginal progesterone, not really a lot of help with GSM, really we're using progesterone, you know, to prevent endometrial cancer, endometrial hyperplasia. Um, for patients that have a uterus, if they don't have a uterus, you can still use progesterone. It helps for sleep and mood and all sorts of other great things. Vaginal preparations of it typically are messy and expensive though, so often we just kind of go with an oral progesterone there. Um, testosterone, once again, great for vestibular function um, in the vestibule of the vagina, but not really going to help much more with actual deep vaginal type um, things. Although there's still a little, some androgen receptors there, but an androgens in excess quantity will get converted into estrogens via what's called aromatase. And so that's something to consider too. And that kind of is a good segue into, you know, specific conditions that we want to look for GSM in. So the first one, the, probably the big one is cancer patients. 100% um, especially patients who have, you know, breast cancer, estrogen receptor positive cancers, and are going on estrogen, you know, kind of blockers or an aromatase inhibitor like letrozole. Those patients are at very, very high risk for developing GSM. And usually that GSM is really severe. Um, and so that's definitely something you can talk to treating, um, you know, those genital symptoms, um, you know, in conjunction with your oncologist. Lots of data coming out, lots of data that has been out about the safety of vaginal hormone medications in those patients. Um, so sometimes you may have to bring a little bit of data to those oncology visits, you know, or talk with your, you know, kind of hormone, you know, menopausal specialist and have them talk to your oncologist. You know, I don't care. I'll talk to oncologists all day long. Um, other things, you know, POI I've talked about before. Obviously, that's basically just those menopausal changes just earlier in, in your life. Um, nursing is a big one that we see. Um, for nursing mothers, now postpartum anyway, you're going to have a drop in estradiol levels just because pregnancy has such high levels of estrogen with it. Um, but nursing, the prolactin the brain produces to help, you know, promote lactation, prolactin, real creative there, hormone naming people, um, is an estrogen antagonist. And so you're going to see a drop in estradiol levels. So those patients will really have, as my dad said, that granny fanny. Um, he just delivered babies, really. I mean, he did some kind of ecology, but, you know, he was much more of an obstetrician and a fantastic obstetrician, whereas I am much more of a gynecologist. So, um, but that's, uh, you know, you can definitely use these vaginal preparations for nursing moms. Um, like I said, there's really no systemic spread there. Now, there's not really any data. This is all anecdotal, but I have tons of anecdotal evidence for that and hopefully be pre presenting something about Interosa and that here in just a little bit. So... Um, otherwise, you know, that's kind of the gist of it. We're kind of approaching that 18 minute mark. So thanks for watching. If you've watched this this whole time, as always, like and subscribe. I really appreciate it. Um, and share this video. This knowledge needs to get out there. There are so many people suffering unnecessarily with GSM. It's, it's mind boggling to me. So yeah, share it with if you know people who have these conditions. So otherwise, I'm Corey Babb. I've got big news coming up very soon. So I'll talk to you in a little bit. Thanks. Bye.